Hello and welcome to the Data Economy. My name is Porter Stoll and I'm going to be taking you on a journey here today at Consensus, talking about what is the data economy, why is it important, and how it's going to transform so much of what we know in technology over the next decade. Sit back, relax, buckle up. Hopefully you're going to be as enthusiastic as I am on the data economy, what it is, and how it's going to transform so much that we know. So let's dive right in. Right now, society creates 329 exabytes of data a day. I know we talk about exabytes, petabytes, and all these terms. You can't fathom an exabyte of data. Just to give you a little bit of context, from the history of the world to 2003, the world had only created five, five exabytes of data. And now we're getting to a point where we're creating 329 exabytes of data a day. And really, what do you do with all this data? Right now, think of it as like a storage unit. We've all moved places and we've put all this junk into storage and that's really what's going on in data today. And this was made possible by the invention of public cloud. Public cloud made it easy and achievable to just store all this data that you were creating, that society was creating affordably and just, just in case. Uh, but again, if you've ever had a storage unit, then you packed full of gills between moves, you have to ask yourself, right. what in here is valuable? So I'm going to keep going with this storage metaphor because most people have done a storage unit at some point in their lives and put stuff in there. And again, if you like me and you've used a storage unit, you might not have gotten to your storage unit for an entire year. And that really makes you ask the question, well, what in here is important to me? What in here is valuable? So let's dive into what's valuable when you store something. Well, you can kind of break it down very simply into two categories. You have things that have sentimental value. You have your old photo albums. You, maybe you have the trophies from your youth sports uh, that uh, you have as a kid that your mom gave you to get rid of. Uh, but you also have stuff that has real value. Maybe you have an antique record collection. Maybe you have an old TV that's like becoming retro again. But again, you have these two things that are sentimental value or monetary value. And that's really no different for data. And it's no different whether it's an individual or as a business. Your data either has sentimental value or monetary value. For most of us, as an individual, our data is mostly sentimental value. We store pictures, we store movies, we store you know, various things that are important to us, but not necessarily things that have open market value. For a business, it's a little bit different. Their data has a lot of market value uh, and less sentimental data uh, value. But again, they, a lot of businesses keep things around because they want to preserve that data. So let's talk about how this all relates to data monetization. So data monetization is when creators now have the tools and protections to release their data into an open marketplace so they can begin to understand what is the value of that data? What is this really worth? Oh. Uh, and this is possible because of the convergence of multiple technologies that have been advancing rapidly as we speak today. This is the ABCs, uh, ABCDs coined by Mark Yusko from Morgan Creek Digital about the convergence of artificial intelligence, blockchain, chips, and data. Artificial intelligence has created the buyer of data. Blockchain is what provides the transparency uh, and immutability around the data. And while chips and data, the, the data storage ecosystem, the hardware components of the ABCDs is what's making it scalable and affordable for a much wider scale adoption. And it's these technologies and how they come together and intersect that's making the data economy really exciting and possible today. Data marketplaces are already in existence. You see this from major, major tech companies such as AWS, Google, IBM, uh, even Azure. They're, they're already selling data and they do over a billion dollars in annualized revenue every year. So why is the data economy that I'm describing different? And it, it involves around the premise that uh, the Web3 ethos says all digital assets of value will inevitably live on chain. 
and that to maximize the true potential of what your asset, digital asset could be worth, it needs immutability. It needs to be on chain. It doesn't like have a single point of failure. It's not participating in these siloed organizations or data marketplaces that the Web2 providers typically provide. Web3 is all about breaking down those walls, making it more permissionless to participate. And with that becomes a much larger potential for, for growth and scalability. So what happens when your data has value? So many people haven't grappled with this question. Again, going back to that storage unit which is just packed full of crap, no one has asked the question, what in here is valuable? And the same goes with your data. No one has explored what their data is worth, and no one's had a means for doing so reliably because frankly there hasn't been a very universal buyer such as AI and what uh, AI represents. But when you have something of value, chances are people will want to buy it. And this is a simple yet important premise as you look at the data economy. And LLMs are the big new buyer in town. Now, what an LLM wants is quality. They want to, you know, if you're gonna train your, your LLM on data, you want to make sure that it, it came from the source, the most trusted sources. It came from the research institution. So you need provenance that like, all right, this, this research came from MIT. This research came from Stanford. And if you think about regulated industries such as pharmaceuticals, healthcare, finance, they're gonna require that quality assurance and auditability so you can understand exactly what's in the LLM uh, as they, they come out with that outcomes. Nothing categorizes this better than the debate going on right now between OpenAI and the New York Times. So the New York Times is saying, yes, you scraped my data publicly, but again, I, this is my IP, you did not have my permission to take it. And, but again, the reason why OpenAI wanted New York Times data, because it was a high quality source of trusted information. And it's that premise that's going to be the foundation for the data economy moving forward. And if you're talking about enterprises, enterprises is all about top line growth. I remember back in early in my career, I was uh, having a couple beers with the investment, the innovation team of a major uh, investment bank. And what they outlined to me is cost innovations, they're nice to have, they're cute. You know, people, if they're really transformative, yeah, people will take you serious. But if you have a revenue innovation that changes top line growth projections for a big business, people will line up around the block to talk to you and understand what you've provided. And the data economy represents just that type of revenue innovation. And once enterprises see the potential that data represents, it's gonna go gangbusters. And so the massive uh, transformation becomes when you look at these businesses and how much they spend annu annually on data storage. They spend $40 billion per quarter today on data storage. Now, not all that data, just like what's in your storage unit, is valuable. But let's say they identify 20%, 30% of that data that has real market value. They can begin to monetize that data through LLMs to begin to transform their whole business model. Now data, st data storage transforms from a cost center, a major cost center, into a revenue center. And that changes everyone's relationship with data instantaneously. And this future is not some five year plan down the road. This future is here today and it's getting more credibility and scalability on a daily basis. So, I, you know, Raul Paul, I'm a big fan and he talks about the banana zone. He's talking about that in recent terms around like crypto in general. But the banana zone for data as an asset class is where enterprises rush through the door to make sure that their data is being monetized to its maximum potential and participating in this data economy. Because enterprises know or businesses know that they represent high quality, trusted, branded data that can be used to train these LLMs. And again, once you get resolution on the New York Times Open on AI use case, you're gonna see that IP protection come in where now you've really sparked the need to buy these data sets for your LLM. Not everyone's gonna get away with what OpenAI has gotten away with today by you know, scraping the internet. P 
People are going to build very custom LLMs for very custom use cases, and you're going to have to provide full auditability on what data is in that LLM, and that's the basis and fundamentals for the data economy. So right now you have various types of asset classes. You have equities, fixed incomes, cash, real estate, commodities, and alternative investments. So really what we're talking about is an alternative investment, where data becomes one of the primary pillars in the alternative investment asset class. And when you look at asset classes, you think of the definition of anything with a stable cash flow can be securitized and turned into an asset-backed security. And when you think of data as an asset-backed security, where it, data itself, these data sets have cash flows, where you know, whether it's being called on by an AI agent where the data owner gets credit for uh, populating that AI agent response, or that data is being downloaded by another LLM to support the growth of their model, that's the cash flows we're talking about here that really give the data economy its, its life. And then all of a sudden, when you think about that model, if data set has a cash flow and it's predictable, now it becomes much like your mortgage. So when these assets begin to be securitized because there's global participation as well as global demand for LLM generation, that's where this really takes off. And I, it may seem like science fiction for if you're hearing this for the first time, but you think about all the businesses that you know, and you can come up with very specific examples of Pfizer's done research. Pfizer wants that research to be accessible to other pharmaceutical makers around the globe. Uh, they can provide that data set for sale at a price in an open marketplace. Anyone can use it. Pfizer can be compensated for that participation and have protections that that data is secure and immutable and that's, like, that's what gives them the confidence to put this data out there into an open marketplace. So ask yourself, what does the future look like when all these people want to buy data for LLMs? LLMs, if you've ever used ChatGPT, you understand the value of how easy it is to access this huge corpus of data but to get the very specific nugget that you are looking for. That's the transformational impact. That's what's going to fuel the data economy. And at the end of the day, if you are going to be a data owner or data creator, there's just certain things you want. You want your data to be programmable, immutable, verifiable, with no single point of failure. These are the table stakes for putting your data that has value out there in an open and decentralized ecosystem globally, where you have faith and trust that it is being handled appropriately and you are getting compensated for its use uh, at every point in, that it, it's being leveraged. And there's one solution that gives you programmability, immutability, verifiability with no single point of failure, and that's Filecoin. If you want to know more about how to store your data uh, to participate in the asset economy or the data economy going forward, and why Filecoin is such an instrumental tool for decentralized storage to make that reality possible, please come and talk to us at the booth. Please engage with us online. Please come find us in the community. What you will find is that the Filecoin ecosystem is filled with talented and smart individuals in data storage and in Web3, making this reality a, a future a reality on a daily basis. Come meet Filecoin. Come participate in the data economy. Thank you for your time.